Alyssa from DC. I'm in DC too. <laughs> hey, hey Madagascar. Okay. Indonesia, y'all. This is so nice. Uh oh, now we are on YouTube Live. This is so exciting. I cannot even take it. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> So now I'm thinking, I wonder if people can see on a YouTube live because. Hey, Melissa from DC. I'm in DC too. <laughs> I wonder if people can see. Hey, hey in Augusta. Okay. Yeah, I think people can see because Vinny can see uh, we are live on YouTube now. now I've got a notification. I'm going to hear it. It's so exciting. I cannot even take it. Okay, let me see. This is ridiculous. Okay. I think I wonder if people can see live because people can see it. Yeah, I think people can because maybe I can see if you're live on YouTube. I put an Okay, yeah, because I'm on YouTube too. So, okay, let me just get the link and yeah. Brazil in the house. I love mm. it. Can everyone, okay, perfect. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. All right, perfect. Yep. All right, this is so great. So it's, everything is on YouTube Live and so yeah, we have 73 participants so far. Great, great, great. So, ooh, from Brussels. Oh my gosh, there's so many different people. Okay, so let's just, you know, get started because let's get to it. So hi, hi everyone. I'm Jamie Swift. I'm the executive director of Black Mirror Radicals. It's really nice to just be here with you all. So welcome to African Feminist Perspectives Matter. Um, and I'm super excited. We have like a outstanding, amazing hosts and panelists and who are ready to give you their perspectives on what it means, what African feminisms mean, what does African feminist perspective mean, and also how we can expand our political understandings of uh, African feminisms and add them to our black feminist praxis. So um, I just wanna make, make it clear like this is a safe space. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat. I'll be monitoring the YouTube live and Twitter, but this is a safe space. So no uh, transphobia, queerphobia, homophobia, ableism, sexism, massage and war. It's not allowed and you will be kicked out. That's just my, my kind way to say it. So be good. Okay. So I just really want to pass it over to Nana, who is our amazing host and you will not be seeing anymore, me anymore. So I'm super excited to learn from everyone and please enjoy this conversation. Bye. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work and for having us really share this space to have a really great conversation. So I want to introduce our panelists to everybody before we get started and get into the questions. Um, so first up is Kim Love Black, who uses she, her pronouns, and she is the Executive Director of Trans Positives Uganda with a mission of creating a community that both supports and cares for trans women, sex workers, and refugees who are HIV positive, enabling them to live the best life possible. Next, we have Dr. Tirza Silva Lima Neves, who uses she pronouns as well from Cabo Verde. And she's a proud wife, mom, scholar, award-winning professor, and Black African feminist. She's associate professor of political science and chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Johnson C. Smith University. Thank you for joining us. Sa'aret Yosef, who uses she her pronouns as well, is an Ethiopian American writer, multidisciplinary artist who's from Washington, DC. Um, her creative inquiries explore themes of identity, culture, migration, and memory across the African diaspora. Thank you for joining us. We also have activist and consultant Francois Madute, who uses she her pronouns as well, and is the founder and creator of Yala Blog, where she explores what it means to be an African feminist today through intimate conversations with young African women. Thank you for joining us. And last but certainly not least is Nampa Shivuta, who is a freelance writer, documentarian, and activist residing in Namibia. Um, her latest film for Redfish, titled Sodom and Gomorrah, was released in October 2019 and centers on the oppression of LGBTQIA 
communities of Uganda. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, so now we can jump into the questions. Um, and I crafted this in mind with really wanting to know more about you, your stories and the current work that you do. So our first question is, when did you know that you were an African feminist and what events solidified your, com your commitment to African feminism, both in theory and praxis? So what brought you to this space and what keeps you in this space? And anyone can start. Well, I'm, I'm happy to kick it off. Um, just, uh, I think the probably shorter answer is I just, I come to this space um, very much as a, as a student uh, and uh, very much with uh, questions as an Ethiopian American. Uh, I think that there is so much that I have to learn between and, and, and so many resources to pull. Um, I think of my ancestors as really kind of a constellation um, on both sides of the ocean that I can just kind of connect um, and, and really draw from um, both inspiration and strength and, and, and really um, scholarly resource. Um, and I think the longer answer is uh, I am a daughter of uh, Ethiopians, uh, students themselves, activists uh, who came to America in very like formative years in their lives. My mom came when she was 18 years old and I think really just kind of instilled feminism in me at a very cellular level, you know, I think um, I come from a naming tradition in Ethiopia where uh, the, it's patriarchal and the man gets its first name is your last name. Uh, and I, my mother inserted her name into my name and gave me her middle name, uh, you know, her first name is my middle name, you know, so I think just at a very fundamental level and in a very daily kind of way, I, I have really absorbed African feminism and I just come as a very humble student. Okay, I'll go second. Um, I'm so glad to be in this space. And first of all, I'd like everyone to know we are not in the feminism space by mistake. We are chosen to be here to work for the rest of the people who cannot really talk. May started uh, activism in 2013. That is when uh, I lost a very good friend. She was a trans woman who died of HIV. So when this friend died, when in the hospital wanted to do research on her body, and I was like, no, this is not acceptable. People thought he was gay. And because people didn't have idea in Uganda who a trans person is, I decided to start activism about trans issues using my social media platform. And I always tell people, we don't need money sometimes to, to, to work, to do our feminism. We need spaces where we can, where we can speak. For me, I've used social media, especially Facebook and Instagram to advocate for the rights of trans women who are living with HIV. And I'm so glad that in my country I'm coming from, that is Uganda, people have really understood who a trans person is. People used, used to hate me so much, but I insisted. I'm like, I'm a trans woman. You have to know, you have to know I'm a trans person. I have to be respected. You have to respect me. You have to respect everybody. So as I'm speaking right now, because of my social media page, I have over 45,000 followers on Facebook. And in my country, it is, the country is really very, very homophobic and transphobic. But people now have started treating me as a celebrity because I was brave enough to speak about trans issues. And I've been, I've been in very many feminism spaces. I'm a human rights defender. I fight for rights of every woman in this country. I've been close to Dr. Stella Nyanzi because she's a writer, she's a poet. She was arrested. Because, because of her poems. And I've, I've stood with her and I've supported her all the time since she was arrested. I've visited her in prison. She has been in prison for over a year plus. I've visited her every single week to show her that as feminists and as women, we still support you, doctor. And I'm glad to say you're all doing amazing work and we should not stop. Me, my motto is I'll not stop until we are all recognized as women. Women need to be respected and we need to use all platforms we can or we have to speak so that people can hear who we are. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Hi, um, um, uh, please go ahead, Tessa. No, no, please go. Well, okay. I Thank you. Hi, so um, thanks uh, for, I'm so excited to be here. So first thanks and thanks Nana for getting us 
uh, started. Um, uh, I, for me, I think I came to uh, feminism. Uh, first, I started working on women's rights, honestly, because it was assigned to me. I was working in an NGO and it was the, the next assignment. It was given to me, the new girl. And I, and I started working on women's rights, specifically uh, on ending child marriage. And at some point I realized two things. Uh, first is that uh, these issues that I was working on were presented to me as single issues, like one issue, but I realized they were all connecting with each other and they were all symptoms of uh, uh, something deeper within, uh, that I didn't have the language for. I, I wasn't, I didn't know to, to call it patriarchal norms, etc. but really that's the first thing I realized. And once I'd realized that I couldn't help but ask myself, well, how do, what are the politics uh, behind like all the policies that I'm advocating for when I go and work at the African Union, etc. And how do those politics apply not just at work, but also when I go home and the way I interact with my family, uh, with my partner, my kids, all of that. So I think really that was the, you know, we often say the personal is political as though we start from the personal, we go to the political. In my case, it was actually going from the political and into the personal and making sure um, there was alignment there. And I think lastly, I would say I also came and I keep growing just as I had it. I feel like a constant learner and I'm learning a lot from conversations with other African feminists every single day. They nourish me, nurture me more than I could say. So that's me. I guess I'll take the, the reins next. Um, so how did I arrive at feminism? I think when I think, not really, so I'd like to say first, let me say I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, United States. Uh, this is where I reside, originally born and raised in the Cape Verde Islands, Cabo Verde in West Africa. Um, a small island state, a very new uh, country. And in that space, I used to watch my aunts so boldly and fabulously playing sports. They owned all the sports. They played handball, basketball, football, soccer. <clears throat> and, um, and that inspired me. I mean, just watching them um, play, it, it, it was so inspiring and empowering. I think if I think of recol uh, my first recollection of when I thought about women's empowerment was watching my aunt, uh, my mom's sisters play sports. And then, um, then when I came to the United States, I can think of, this is gonna be an interesting story. I, th I can think of arriving at my master's thesis. So this, this, is, was in, this is what inspired my master's thesis project was having to, um, having, being forced to make eggs and rice for my dad. The reason why that's a problem is because I hate eggs. Don't like the smell of them, don't wanna see them. I'll eat them in things like cake, but I don't, don't ask me to make eggs, I just won't. But being a girl, I was told that I had to respect my father and I needed to make rice and eggs for my father because he was the head of the household. And it created a huge problem, you know, so he, he exercises silence for like a couple of days. Uh, I didn't make the eggs, so nobody in the house was talking to me. So, <laughs> um, and, and mind you, this is in high school and I was attending an all girls high school. So the duality of my life was so crazy during those teenage years because I'm going to an all girls private high school, which is, you know, predominantly white and elite. And as an immigrant girl, African immigrant girl, then I'm going home and asked to, you know, I'm being told that I need to make eggs for my dad, which is, I cannot stand the smell of. It actually makes me very nauseous. And so that actually inspired my master's thesis to look at how patriarchy is set up back in Cape Verde and the role women have played in the development of the country. And so, but how, what specific events to answer that question, what specific events um, leads me here and, and leads my curiosity to wanting to really just do this work has to do with being in graduate school and wanting to know really amazing and inspiring Cape Verdean women and doing research on them and not finding them anywhere and in English. 
So for those of us who know, Cape Verde is a former uh, Portuguese colony. So Portuguese is our official language. Cape Verdean Criollo is our um, mother language. But um, most of the research, or most of everything that exists is going to be in Portuguese. So one, you I found a couple of things about the women who were in the struggle for independence. And then they were in Portuguese. So yes, I can access that because I do speak and I do, I, I can read Portuguese, but not having them in English was also an issue, which means that many, many people don't know what Cape Verdean women uh, were doing back then and, and it's not readily accessible. And then in Portuguese, it was extremely limited of what actually was out there. And so that is really what sparked my interest in saying, I need to add to this. This is ridiculous. Where is the inspiring stories? How do, how do I know, how do I tell, um, where do I look for stuff that, that, tells, that, that tells about my history and my role as, as a feminist and as a woman in, in, the, in the development of this country? And what really am I uh, telling my daughter and my son about the role of women in my country and in Africa in general. And so I wanted to be part of that conversation, not only conversation, but I wanted to be part of that history making. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so yes, um, I'm Nampa and uh, for me it was, um, I think sometimes I feel like I kind of stumbled into feminism a bit, but it was a gradual, like there was a, a gradual journey to it, um, but not that I really anticipated. I mean, a couple, probably around 10 years ago, I would have never said I'm a feminist. I, it's just something that I didn't, I didn't see myself as at. And um, so just to start at the beginning of my journey, maybe I was raised or I grew during Namibia's liberation struggle. Um, I was born in exile in Zambia in, as a refugee. And as such, I ended up in, G, in the GDR, which is the German Democratic Republic at the time um, during the Cold War when, oh, uh, yes, we are Cold War babies. <laughs> or struggle, struggle, kid, struggle kids, as they used to be called here. And so I ended up in the GDR and um, because it was a socialist country, um, I grew up basically on socialism and because of the whole attachment to the liberation struggle in my country, also as very pan-Africanist and through the combination of those uh, two as an internationalist. So that was, um, kind of my upbringing, but even within that, I mean, there was a lot of centering on the on the men um, of the movement, whether it was the liberation movements here, or also just the people that I later chose as my role models were people that reflected where I felt, um, you know, so it would be um, like, for instance, uh, the Black Panthers or, you know, because of their work, uh, socialist work in the United States and because of also their understanding of internationalism in the struggle, or it would be, you know, people like uh, Miriam Makeba who also had that um, kind of understanding and also, you know, just, it was often people who either lived in exile or people who understood uh, the importance of internationalism um, through throughout the liberation struggles, wherever they took place. So um, when I joined Twitter at some point, of course, I felt like I was, you know, a pan-Africanist and, you know, I know a lot and I, <laughs> I felt very like I can share and I've got something to say. And, you know, so we started out with um, educating people on pan-Africanist um, heroes, and a lot of them obviously were men, you know, as the leaders of liberation struggles or whatever. And the women were very much always in the shadows and um, didn't really hear, didn't hear at all about non-binary people or um, trans people at all during the struggle years. Um, and uh, I realized then on Twitter after following Pan-Africanist 
feminists or pan-Africanist women who I later realized were feminists, um, like Simpiwe Dana and Sianda, um, I think she goes by Sianda Wrights at that time, Jackie the poet. So, and they kept talking about women's issues. Um, and of course I could relate to it all because you know it was the issues that I could relate to and I could also relate to it because they were coming from it from a pan-Africanist point of view. Um, but even then I didn't really realize that there was anything missing within the conversation like um, um, within pan-Africanism as such. And until at some point when I started organizing a bit also on social media with a, a group of young international leftists and um, they were very they were very vocal about LGBTQI issues, you know, um, they were very, they, we would start meetings and people, you know, introduce them same with pronouns and stuff. And this was all very unfamiliar to me at that time. Uh, but it was also, it kind of held up a mirror to me. And then through, through, through the continuous work that I did then through my activism, I realized that, hey, I'm actually looking at myself. So I could see myself as a, a gender non-conforming woman. I could see myself as a feminist at some point because I realized all these pan-Africanist women that I'm following, hey, they're feminists. And at some point, I think somebody also wrote an article and I'm like, why am I always fighting this? If this is exactly <laughs> what I'm fighting for, you know, like, I'm like, wow, I think I am a feminist. So it was like a really gradual, gradual walk into it kind of. And, um, but I think what really, cemented my, my commitment to feminism and just the broader aspects of it was um, when I, through my spiritual journey, also started embracing, um, you know, aspects that are also not as discussed, like witchcraft and stuff like that, which I could identify with and um, also, you know, use in my own practice. And um, I think seeing myself then completely outside of the system was what made me realize that the system needs to go, you know, like it's, it's clearly not working and um, it's not working for me. And I could finally see also how, when I thought it was working for me, that it was absolutely not doing that. So, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all for sharing your stories. I feel like I've learned so much about you just in hearing this like brief stories and can relate to a lot of it. I wanted now to know, especially since we've been focusing or what feels like to me a larger theme of needing a space or needing to be around colleagues, comrades who are invested in new systems, new ways of thinking that centered the most marginalized within our societies across the continent. I was wondering what makes African feminism for you and maybe even those you're like, you work along with the people who are in your family or are part of your diaspora, what makes African feminism radical? And why is it necessary? Can I go first? Absolutely. Sure. Okay, thank you. No, uh, African feminism is radical because as women, we've not give, we've not Give, been given space since way back during the African traditional society. Women have women are minorities. Women have been inferior all the time. So by the time some of us stand up and we are like, no, enough is enough. We have to fight for the rights of all women, girls, teenagers, and everybody. So that that's what makes it being radical, because we are penetrating into a very very hard rock which is not easy to pass through. We are using platforms. We are using all the little strength we have to advocate for the rights of women and girls. So th that's what makes it radical because we are so brave. We, we, we come to advocate for our rights because we are not happy with what's going on. We come to advocate because we are really annoyed. We are not happy. We are very tough. So we are not going to, we are not going to come and smile as we are talking about our rights now. We have to come with these very bad, gloomy black faces for black women. And these people really have to understand what we are talking about. 
So the reason why our feminism is radical is because we are very tough and we are very strong women with thick skins. Thank you. I, would, I just want, first want to kind of uh, amen Keem. I've just been like <laughs> so grateful to hear um, your your voice um, and everything that you've been saying. I've been nodding, nodding along to, um, especially the the kind of sacredness of space. Um, and I feel that this this you know cipher or this circle or whatever this is is very much that. Um, and and it really resonated with me um, what you t what you said about. Um, this conversation and just Afri African feminism being meant to be, um, as well as uh, what Nampa, I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, um, what you were saying about this kind of gradual walk into feminism, because I think that um, the, the, the kind of the root of oppression is very much fear, right? Um, and of the power of both, you know, blackness and and women and the divine feminine, um, I believe. And I think that so much of the the kind of the power and agency that's that you are able to demonstrate and achieve in just being you and breathing and speaking and sharing your story is really what is is so scary to the powers that be, you know. Um, and 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 us finding the language to to share our stories and to name these things that we've been feeling is really almost like, it feels like almost like an incantation of a spell, you know? That's why I'm like, you know, the more, the same, I, I, again, like amening what uh, Nampa was saying, because it's like, yeah, even witchcraft, I think that it's it's really not, the narrative that's been put out there about what it is, is really not your narrative, it's our narrative, right? Because we have so much untapped power um, <laughs> within the kind of, cosmology of Africanness, of Blackness, you know? Um, so I just feel so empowered anytime I'm able to hear stories like yours and every time I'm able to find a new word or language to identify something that I've been feeling that's outside of the very, very repressive system, an intentionally repressive system. You know, said it. it's really interesting that you say that because I think about, and I'm going to talk about Cape Verdean reality just because there's it's so limited, the amount of uh, literature that is written by um, Cape Verdean um, scholars and um, the experiences of Cape Verdean women in particular is just, it's very limited. And those that what does exist is, in, is, is also in Portuguese, limiting also the, how many people can actually have access to it. But it's really interesting that you say that because this whole concept of feminism um, in Cape Verde particularly the word itself, the use of the word and, and, and calling yourself a feminist, that is very, so radical in the context of Cape Verde, right? So wanting to incorporate um, the word feminism in our daily lives and national discourse is extremely radical, even for a country that considers itself an African success story, a success story of development and democracy, whatever that means, but that there's still people who are still living marginalized. But yet, if you call yourself a feminist, that's like, it's a dirty word. So it's such, it's supposed to be such a progressive space and country with such a great African example, but yet the F word is like, are you kidding me? Right, and so that within itself is 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 radical. And I would also add add that, uh, and I'm sure that in many African cases, in well global cases, radical. When we talk about um, um, radical feminism or just feminism alone, it's it's intergenerational and it's contextual, right? So I think about for the women in the 1960s who were fighting for the independence, who were fighting alongside the men and, and making the case for um, the concept of ending Portuguese occupation of Cape Verde, that in itself was radical at that time, right? Uh, and uh, whereas currently I would say that ridding Africa of foreign occupation is radical, right? Uh, we could, you know, that's a whole other topic for another time. And so, because <laughs> I was about to go on a tangent, but I was like, okay, Teresa, stay focused, stay focused. And so, but women, <laughs> you know, we're faced with this double invisibility um, back then and now of colonialism and patriarchy. But then if I think about it, I would say that, and 
some people would consider this radical thinking, I don't, that colonialism brought patriarchy. So for me, colonialism still exists because patriarchy still exists, right? Because none of us that are on this panel right now um, can just walk freely in any African state, country, and talk about being feminist without somebody either trying to physically harm us, emotionally harm us, or have something you know uh, verbally uh, crazy to say to us, right? And so it's still that dirty word. And so that to me, including this whole notion of, of, of African feminism um, in national discourse is still, it is so radical because folks are still acting out, you know, still out here questioning. And also folks are being radically speaking murdered for the fact that they want women's rights. That's crazy within itself. And I'll stop right there. I think I'll jump in. Thanks for that, Teresa. I, I think uh, when I think about radical as a word, so I, 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 I think about roots. Um, which I think is also the etymology. And I think for me, Afri what makes African feminist radical is that it goes back to the fact that it's the, the, to the understanding that patriarchy is at the root of, of the issues that we're looking at. And, and if you look at the documents like uh, the African Feminist Charter, I, I like the way like, that document takes the time to define what we mean by patriarchy and also to look at how do we root our feminist practice uh, how do we infuse it in all aspects of our lives, so our, our, in our individual ethics, our organizational ethics, our leadership ethics? So for me, that that makes that's part of what makes it uh, radical. And the second thing I believe um, is also the the use of voice, especially uh, more and more so now. But I think it's not new. I'm thinking about uh, our Tiam's book, uh, which I think in English the title is uh, "Speak Out, Black Sister." It's really this idea of like using our voices, uh, just using our voices, owning our voices is such a radical act, I think, for us as African women, um, because like I feel like the the, the entire world and the, 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 this patriarchal world and the continent we live in is literally designed to silence us. So I think that insistence on, on insistence on using our voices despite everything is what is part of, I believe, uh, makes our practice radical. Thank you. Yeah, Tess, I actually didn't want you to stop um, about when you started on imperialism because that's exactly the, the route that I think is very, very important and very much at the center of um, the type of feminism I consider radical. Um, especially um, living on the African continent, we know imperialism is a problem, has been a problem, and um, that even though we have uh, won the liberation struggles, which is also debatable in some cases, um, we are not free on this continent. We are not free on this continent, um, not, and we will never be, not under patriarchy and definitely not under uh, imperialist conditions. Um, so for me also feminism and especially African feminism also needs to be in, first of all, I think there should be definitely an anti-capitalist um, uh, I, I can't see feminism functioning within the framework of capitalism. I, I don't, I, it, 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 it doesn't, um, it, capitalism, you know, brings about many of the inequalities that we see in our daily lives. And as such, I think feminism geared at really eradicating um, these inequalities should take a look at capitalism and then of course definitely that's why um, imperialism also and um, at the same time I also think that what um, on the African continent is also very very much important to take into consideration that um, our feminism should be radical enough to be inclusive to everybody who um, who we are advocating for who we are um, who we are representing and as such we cannot 
um, be radical feminists and uh, be anti-LGBTQI plus people or uh, be um, radical feminists but not care about um, women or people in Tanzania or wherever um, being murdered because um, there are black people living with albinism or you know like so there's there's a lot of I think that is also what um, was said earlier that feminism should be it should grab by the root and take out everything that is not serving us and I think sometimes we focus on certain aspects and leave out a whole lot of other aspects which are still functioning within the system that we are saying that we want to eradicate and as such um, I think we also as radical feminists need to be able to imagine a life outside of patriarchy as a, a life outside of imperialism so I think feminism is also radical feminism very much looks to the future and looks to the past definitely to fix what hasn't gone right to get wisdom and everything but also we need to carry that past into the future and um, I think for me radical feminism needs to cross uh, you know, we're not just in the present and we're not just looking at the past, but we need to have some type of vision of where we're going to. And um, yes, and I can't carry capitalism into that vision, neither imperialism. Thank you all for that. Once again, a great like sort of session speaking to what African feminism looks like, what it should be, what it can be. Now I'm hoping we could hear more from you all in terms of African feminists past and present that have influenced your work the contributions to your country or your region that makes them stand out and what sort of insight you think they would provide like even now for what we're experiencing globally around the pandemic as African people. Um, so yes, uh, for me it's been again Simpi Dana who has been very, she was basically for me like a, an eye opener into this world of African feminism. And um, she's a South African musician for those that don't know. Um, she's a South African musician, but um, she, what I like about her is that she also is very inclusive of um, mental health issues and um, self care and you know, like all these aspects that we also sometimes tend to not not think about as activists sometimes because you're just busy and you're trying to get the work done and you know and we wear ourselves out a lot I think and um, I like her very much in that um, I think she has taught me that it's okay to also sometimes take a break away from from activism to nurture yourself and to just you know get yourself back to be able to do this um, fight and then um, just somebody else that I would like to, oh yes, and um, what I also like about her is that her um, feminism is also, and her pan-Africanism as such, is as it should be inclusive of the African diaspora of you know Africans living um, in 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 the United States in the Caribbean in the um, wherever you find African people um, that is a part of Africa uh, um, that is a part of Africa that you know was taken from here at some point or other or who moved at some point or another but it is still a part of Africa. And, um, and all African peoples should definitely um, be a part of, should be included under um, African feminism. And um, I know a couple of years ago, and this is um, one of the contributions that I feel that she has made to the continent. Um, a couple of years ago, she had, um, she organized, a, Ooh, I don't want to call it a get together, but it was like a conference, I guess, at the AU, at the um, AU headquarters in Addis, and um, brought together a whole range of 
um, African artists from the continent, from abroad, and discussed a whole wide range of issues uh, in how the arts can be used to bring Africa into the future that we want, or how the arts can help contribute to the Africa that we want. And what I also very, very much like about um, what came out of that meeting is also um, there, there were I mean, there were people like even Yasin Bey um, from, from the US. Is there my generation out there familiar with Yasin Bey? <laughs> yes, Sarah. And um, so people like that were there. Donisha Prendergast was there, Bob Marley's uh, granddaughter. And um, she, for instance, spoke about the um, if it would be possible, for instance, to include Jamaica or perhaps even other Caribbean uh, um, countries into the African Union. So for me, that was um, very, in, not just very interesting for me, it was at that point a clear, yes, of course we should. And I think it's something that we should look at definitely, um, you know, in, if we look at how, how, for instance, the African Union can be strengthened also more. Um, and I think uh, Simkiwe in that case provided a, a very good platform um, to have these type of conversations. And especially also with, with the arts, because the arts are also usually like really left out of conversations very often when we talk about liberation aspects. Uh, so I think that was um, incredible. Can I name another one? <laughs> Since nobody is here. I um, I just want to name another one. And I and and I don't, I'm, I'm not going to call her a feminist because uh, that's not what she called herself. Um, but I think there are a couple of women within our history, obviously, that have been um, th that have applied feminist practice or have um, stood in, in some way, shape, or form, also just led their people in a way that um, that has been beneficial for their people uh, in terms in un, in terms that we hadn't. Okay, let me just talk about her. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's so much easier. Uh, so um, Buya Nehanda, she was a uh, Zimbabwean medium. A spirit medium um, who would communicate with her people through women. So the woman be, is the medium, and um, Mbuya Nehanda is the spirit that then speaks through the woman, and the and the and the woman then later also take on her name as um, as it becomes their name. And during um, the liberation wars of Zimbabwe, for instance, she was very instrumental in leading the first Chimuranga Wars, uh, where she also served as an advisor and, um, you know, spiritual guide to the people that were going into battle and that she was uh, leading into battle. At some point, she was then captured by the British and um, killed, obviously. Uh, because they realized what a powerful force she was that uh, because people were listening to her and obviously she gave spiritual advice and you know they knew when to when to proceed and you know attack and when to so because the British were quite overwhelmed with how did they how how do these people manage to beat us if we are like so powerful and we've got all the guns and everything but somehow you know, um, they still manage. And so she was blamed for that. She and other uh, spirit mediums. Um, and yeah, so for me, she might not be a feminist, but her contribution has been immense. I can um, jump in if that's okay. Um, just to, it's sort of in the same line of thinking about this concept of, um, labeling one as a feminist. Um, some folks would argue that feminism is indeed a, a Western construct, a Western concept. And so I'd, I'd say that, uh, for example, in the Cape Verdean case, there isn't, this country has been independent only in t uh, since 1975, right? So that's a, it's a, it's a baby country um, 45 years ago. But so there is no, um, 
old tradition of, you know, there's no feminist tradition per se, you know, that spans generations and generations. And I would even argue that um, some of the women involved in the struggle never called themselves feminists, right? They, they were, we, we can identify their, what they were doing as uh, Nampa had just mentioned. The work that you do is necessarily within that, that scope, but I'm, I'm cautious about um, calling folks feminist, feminists when they don't do that themselves. And so to answer the question, I would say that um, I'll start first with uh, my grandmother. So who are the feminists past and present that I know that are just so, excuse my French, uh, badasses. Um, so I, the, 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 the biggest feminist badass that I know is my grandmother, 85 years old. Um, my mother, my aunts, my sisters, and also my nine-year-old daughter, because she's teaching me that this new generation of um, black girls and women are out here kicking butt, taking names, taking up space, doing it fabulously, and just inspiring me to just you know, be myself, right? And and um and and I'm here for all of that. And so it's important that um that I say that. And then I always had the audacity to whenever my grandmother visits the US, I always have the audacity um to bring my grandmother as the keynote as as speaker for my classes and I interpret. And so one of my students asked her, you know, are you, you know, are you a feminist? And she said, you know, and it's really interesting that you asked that because I wouldn't have called myself a feminist back then because we didn't have that word, but because y'all have that word now. So yes, I would say I'm a feminist because of everything that I've done and that I continue to do. And so that was really interesting. And she had a good laugh after that. She said that and then she goes, oh my gosh, I'm a feminist. <laughs> You know, like there's a word for it. And so that was, I'll never forget that experience. Um, and so this whole idea um, of, so, and also a couple of other names that is really important. I promised myself that I would say their names because they are normally just hidden, have been hidden by our people, by our government, by, for so long, anyhow, Isaura Gomes, who uh, known as Zao, my great aunt who was part, who was in the struggle for independence. The first, she's, if you look at the Cape Verdean um, Declaration of Independence, she is the only woman who signed it. So mm -hmm. look for the um, Isaura Gomes, that is the only woman's name that you will find in the Declaration um, of Independence. Um, I also want to mention Titina Sila and Carmen Pereira from Guinea-Bissau as the women who also helped both countries become independent from colonial, from Portuguese occupation. I also wanna highlight Paula Forch, Zezinha Chantre, Lilica Boal, Dori Silveira. These are all the women who are my foremothers. They're the reason that I do what I do. Um, they're the reason um, I, I want to uplift and, and platform their names so much because some of them have since passed on. And so now I'm talking about them as, as our ancestors, but so many of them are still here. And I wanna give them all their things while they're still here. And so I will always, in every opportunity, we could be talking about business. I'm still gonna talk about the Cape Verde women who are in the struggle. We could be talking about the sky is blue. I will find a way to, to, to talk about my grandmother, my mother, and, and all the women who were in the struggle. I will figure it out, honey. And so just what is so radical that they did and, and it gives me goosebumps just talking about it, is that everybody recognized their role. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone intentionally and strategically. So when we talk about feminism, even though they didn't call themselves feminists, but their intentionality and their role in that movement was so in, 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 in institutionalizing the Cape Verdean state was so badass that it just, everyone knew the role to play. So for example, a particular family story that embodies what most, if not all the women who were involved in this thing were doing. So my great aunt, um, her mother would, you know, her mother and my grandmother would take care of her children when she went off to go do what she needed to do for the struggle, right? And so she would take care of the, uh, the, the grandmother and my aunt would, would and my grandmother would take care of the children. So everyone knew the role that they had to play. There were women who had to go off and there were women who had to help take care of the children or had to run things in the neighborhood. My mom 
was inf the information deliverer. So she was running intelligence for the for the party. So the, the communication. She was and you know, away from the Portuguese police because the Portuguese police knew they weren't gonna mess with children. They didn't think children are gonna be involved. So my mom was a child at this time. So my mom's carrying party intelligence from members to members around the street, but the Portuguese who would patrol the street didn't know because she's a child, they're not checking for the children. So this is the type of badass feminist dealings we're, 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 we're talking about that weren't called that. And so, and when we talk about building the state, right? And creating the vision for the state, again, my aunt, my great aunt, along with the other women were going abroad to get training. Remember, the state was in its inception. So they were traveling to Cuba, to then Soviet Union, to uh, Brazil to get training, right? To be part of other women's congresses and conferences on how to deal with different things. And so the women that stayed behind, again, were helping them um, take care of the home affairs. And in interviewing some of this woman, some of the work that I have done, they say that we wouldn't be able to do this type of work if everybody in our families and our friends in the community weren't clear about their roles and our roles, right? So these are the types of sacrifices that women, that the women were making. The women that stayed behind were to making those sacrifices, but those that travel were also making the sacrifices. And that to me is such a radical notion of like feminism, womanhood, sisterhood, and, and motherhood that was transformational in state building, right? And so I've kind of written a whole like theory about that. I won't bore you with that. But um, to me, it's, it's fascinating and inspiring when you think about it, that they weren't calling themselves these things, right? They didn't say I'm a radical feminist, but th this to me at the time, going back to my original uh, concept of feminism being, in, uh, being intergenerational and contextual, that was badass and radical at that time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. No, please go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> So for, um, for me, I would like to say that all the panelists are my inspiration. Mm -hmm. For me, it's always good cool to hear and learn from all the feminists, all the new feminists I've come across. But then there are those special people I've, I've read about. Um, there is Awin Okech, there is Zawedi, there is Shamila, and there is Aisha Fahani Ibrahim. I really, I've really read about their work and I was really inspired. But then there is that one person, there's that one woman who I look up to, that is Dr. Stella Nyazi. She's now a political aspirant. She's aspiring to be a member of parliament, representing women in Kampala. Stella Nyazi has done very, very good work. She's a human rights defender, she's a feminist, she's a very strong woman. She has defended LGBTI people. She's using her Facebook page to fight for the rights of the minorities. Mm -hmm. Sir Nyanzi started a campaign, Pads for Girls. This campaign was to, to get parts for girls in rural areas who miss school because then there are menstruation periods. Why did she do that? Because when the president was campaigning, promised girls, if, if they ever vote for him again, she, he's going to buy parts for every girl so that they don't miss school. So when the president went through and when the president won elections, he forgot the promise. And then he came on national TV and they say they don't have money for the parts. So Dr. Sanyanzi started a campaign, raising money, using GoFund, using her own mobile number to raise money to buy pads for girls. When, when Dr. Stella Nyanzi was stopped to work in the, in the university because for her, she was like, he was, she was harassed as an employee. She went to her Facebook page and she posted everything that was happening at the university. So she was expelled. This was really very wrong. She talked about the first lady not being qualified to be the means of education. And then she was totally expelled from the university because she talked about the first lady not having qualifications to be a minister of education. Yes, she was very true. You can't be a means of education without a diploma even in, 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 in education. 
So Stanya stood on her ground and she fought for her rights. Yesterday in her post, she said, I did not fight for only my rights, but for all the rights of employees who are working in the government institute. And she went to court and she has, she has won all, all the cases because she reported how the university wrongfully uh, canceled her contract. This was a lifetime contract and it was canceled. And first she was like, no, it's not right. Stanya has just resigned because she's now a political aspirant. She's becoming a politician, a very good politician. But then, even when she's going to parliament, she's insisting. She's in parliament to fight for the rights of everyone, girls, LGBTI, and women. For me, I really look up to Dr. Stella Nyanzi. There's another feminist called Dr. Slavia Tamari. She's a professor also from Makerio University. She's really, really very nice. I've read a lot of her books. And I remember when Stella Nyanzi had that new protest. Dr. Slavia Tamari had to write a book about Dr. Stella Nyanzi. And she said, when a woman is pushed on the wall and she has nothing to do anymore, the only solution is to unrest herself. So even when Dr. Slanyas was pushed on the world, she did a nude protest because she was fighting for the rights of her job. She really wanted her job back. She's a single mother and she had to take care of her children. For me, I think Dr. Slanyas has changed a lot of people's thinking in this country. Here in Uganda and even the international, international ones. Dr. Slanyas is a very strong woman. She's a very good activist. And for me, I think she, I, she's, she has really inspired me. She's using social media to fight for the rights of people, and I am using social media to fight for the rights of, most especially, trans people, refugees, and sex workers who are living with HIV. I mean, I look up to her. She's a very, very strong woman. And I'd like to salute the host. Thank you so much for involving trans people on this forum. I mean, we've been pushed away from very many feminist forums. And some of us are like, no. And I, I, even on my Facebook page, I've been fighting with feminists in Uganda. Uh, why are you pushing us away? We are women and we are also feminists. So, and I think, thank you for, thank you the host for this wonderful opportunity. I'm really so honored to be here to talk about my issues for myself and other trans people and also women at large. This is really, really very important for us all. And again, to all feminists here on the panel, I salute you, I mean, you're amazing and I'm learning a lot from you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for the great work. You're all inspiring us and thank you for changing the world. You're an inspiration, seriously. I, I'm, I'm getting so much life as I knew I would from this entire panel as well. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly, again, with so much that's been said already um, in terms of like, you know, just the foremothers that we have. And there's so many that, that we can just really just, see, like they just left blueprints, they left keys, you know? Um, and I, I too just feel so, so grateful for my grandmother, for the strong you know, matriarch that I come from immediately from my mother and, and what she got from her mother before her and, and really just the kind of um, the lineage, like the really deep, beautiful lineage that I have and, and all of the stories, each one of the women that kind of come, that I come from are really, all have a story that is so phenomenal. You know, each one of the the accounts that that you gave Namfa, Terza, you know, your aunts so are really badasses and I wholeheartedly agree. And as an aunt myself, I can only hope to be someone that contributes to like this continuum that we're all a part of. Um, and on, you know, on a in, a, in a literary sense, in a creative sense, um, I definitely feel that I get so much inspiration from um, writers, from, from thinkers like um, Lorraine Hansberry. And again, I feel very bereft because I don't know, what, I don't have enough um, uh, knowledge about the, the writers and the revolutionaries on the continent. And that's a space where, again, I come humbly as a student and want to really learn more about my own history um, and about the continental history, um, because there's so much love, revolutionary thinking and creativity there and ingenuity there, um, and so much like d just just badass like womanhood that's happening all across the continent. And especially now because there's so much conflict in Ethiopia alone, and I know all across Africa, there's so much happening right now and around the world. Um, and I really, really just want to to um, to learn more about Ethiopia's history. Um, specifically in about um, African uh, history in general, um, because I come to it with a very kind of Pan-Africanist perspective. 
Um, but Lorraine Hansberry is an amazing writer who had a very similar perspective, who drew from thinkers like Paul Robeson, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, who, you know, really drew the stories from across the continent. And she knew that our stories, both in America, like Black Africans across the diaspora, how connected we are, how connected our futures are. Um, Octavia Butler, who is very much like an Afrofuturist before it was even kind of, you know, in vogue and creating these kind of stories that we're living right now, this dystopian present, like, and, and writing us into the future. Um, Binya Vanga Wainaina um, from Kenya, who I I'm very recently came to learn, but I identify him very much and, and honor his, his memory as, as, uh, as someone who wrote about Africa in a very authoritative way, um, because we deserve to have the authorship over our stories. Um, and, and really came to it from a perspective outside of the, the patriarchy, really harnessing the power of creativity to, to, to amplify, to, to, to really um, nurture our power and to uplift womanhood. Um, and to, to say that like really patriarchy is very much con connected to this colonial history that is not ours. Um, and I feel like I'm, oh, Audre Lorde absolutely has been amazing. Like she has been, this so like she freed me in her with her words, you know, just coming to it, um, to coming to writing as a, as a poet myself, um, you know, she entered every single room, um, just declaring who she was um, as a black woman poet, as a lesbian, as a mother, um, and just naming all the selves that made her whole whole self. Um, and, and declaring, you know, the, how political it was to be radical, to, to, to invest in self-care, how radical that was. Um, I uh, got after, I actually came to, to, to Audrey's work very recently, I'm ashamed to say, um, and that's actually when I, when I was introduced to, uh, to Black Women Radicals and Jamie at a, a screening here in, uh, in DC at Sankofa of Audre Lorde, The Berlin Years, the documentary, which was like, so like, uh, <laughs> and just like her, all the words that I was introduced to um, and, and the perspective that Audre brought um, really was so revolutionary. And I um, found her essays in Sister Outsider and they have just been like balm, you know, especially during this time. Um, and I just apply them as, as much as possible. Um, I've also come to, to discover through Audrey, Pat Parker's poetry, who again, very revolutionary, um, black lesbian, queer woman, um, who just said, you know, my story deserves to be heard and, and using language as her, you know, her, her mode and her means for liberation. So I have so like an immense, immense treasure trove of, of foremothers to who really inspire me. Um, and, and I have so much to learn in these spaces. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm noting all them, everything that you're saying, that I, everything that you've all said that I don't, I didn't know. I'm just keeping, keeping note. And thank you, Nana, for all the links. Uh, I really love that you're doing it in real time. Um, for me, in terms of the African feminists who inspire, uh, influence my work and the way I approach it, I think a lot of them are uh, the feminists I'm talking to every day, honestly. So I feel so blessed. Uh, to be part of a community of African feminists who I can just reach out to with questions uh, uh, because as you said, you know, the, it's a, such a constant learning process. So either uh, there are women who are become friends or are just sisters in the struggle and I have so many, I have so many names, I don't know where to start, but I'm thinking of the top of my head, thinking about Nana Dakoa uh, who started um, Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, which is an amazing blog. Um, or so she's Ghanaian. Or I'm thinking uh, Olu Timehen, um, Adek Beye, a Nigerian queer writer who is has written like so beautifully about the experience of just navigating the word, being who she is, but fully uh, and unapologetically. I'm thinking also about um, African feminists who's writing. Uh, because I've kind of started with conversations, but then I started to like learn more through writing. So sometimes quite theoretical, but the work of Mina Salami, uh, who founded the Miss Afropolitan blog and recently uh, uh, published a book called Sensuous, Sensuous Knowledge. I don't know this word, sorry, I'm Francophone. Eh? Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think her work has been 
really def helping me define, especially her blog, very, um, I don't know, she, she basically understands that we are here to learn and she takes her time teaching us. And I think her, her work has been really amazing. And lastly, not lastly, but almost lastly, uh, I want to also talk about um, feminists who have like used poetry or fiction to like explain to us as I think Nampa you were saying, we need to imagine what a feminist future looks like when we are so busy like fighting the present. And I think the poetry of very modern um, feminists like uh, Ijeoma, who maybe know, sorry, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this well, but uh, her uh, poetry, she has this uh, poetry collection called Questions for Ada, which like is literally a bedside book, like every night, I just pick a random poem and I go to bed in peace. <laughs> a fantastic exploration of like um, all the different pieces of uh, identity, but in a way that is so powerful. Like some feminists are so powerfully embodying what they are about that you can, you have to like meet them where they are. And that's for me, and like surrounding myself with that kind of writing, um, or that those kind of conversations has really been so foundational in terms of helping me grow as every, like patriarchy is trying to pull me back, but these, are, these women are pulling me forward. I'm so, so grateful. So many names, but I think I'm going to stop now. Thank you all for that. I'm sorry for the delay. I was trying to capture as many names as possible. Um, for those who have access to the chat, please make sure to look at the resources and the names that are being shared because it's just a treasure trove has been said. Um, I wanted to now take us to our last question before we take questions from the audience. I'm now interested in learning more from you all about transnational solidarity and a collaboration really. And I think especially is appropriate for the space that we've created this morning. I wanted to know, and here's a question for verbatim. How does African feminism facilitate just relationship building and collaboration across different identities, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's a language, sexuality, um, gender identity and, and representation, expression? So how do we facilitate within African feminism building across differences? And then how also can we learn from African feminists in terms of our organizing, our mobilizing, our leadership? Like how? What can we learn from our sisters on the continent and throughout the diaspora who identify as Afri African feminist? Don't everybody jump at the same time? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think Anyone? it's because it was, um... It was a, it, to, for me, it was a difficult question. Not a difficult question like, oh my gosh, I don't know what the answer was, but it, um, I had to think about it. Um, I think it was, you know, and I, I, I jotted down some ideas, but it was sort of like, I, I was struggling with the fact that I, I, I'm not able to say that not all, that even across the continent, it, um, and even in, 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 in my country, in Cape Verde, um, one of the things that, well, let me say that not all feminists have the same positionality in the same way that they don't in the US or anywhere else. So it, it's kind of hard, right? Um, but I also, I kept coming back to this whole notion of class and how class is still a huge part of this discussion. And, and um, especially when we think about access to space, uh, access to certain spaces, right? Um, even when I think about, you know, my own position and not being able to like fully be able to tell my, to, to read and to tell my history. Um, I think about how the Portuguese were the first to arrive in Africa and the last ones to leave, but somehow Lusophone African experiences in global conversations is still limited, not only in Africa, but also um, throughout, the con uh, throughout the world. Um, just a small example was the fact that when we made the flyer, not we, when Jamie made the flyer for the event, if you notice, Cape Verde is not on the map. Cape Verde is, was not part of, you know, of the flyer, you know, because that's how most maps, uh, I think Madagascar is there, right, on the other side, or um, I'm trying to figure it out. But just those subtle things, but that means so much, 
um, the the invisibility of people, right? And of course, you know, of course, I called out uh, Canva because I Canva the the app that the the flyer was made out of, and I said, when are you gonna start including Cape Verde on the map? You know, we we do there. You know, it's a small country, half a million people, but with a huge diaspora. So when we talk about um, collaboration, solidarity, bring uh, building, especially as it relates to the Cape Verdean state, to, to Cape Verdean feminists. We cannot have a conversation about feminism or change on the status of women um, without talking to our diaspora, without, uh, because there are more people living outside of Cape Verde than there are living in Cape Verde. So half a million live on the, on, in the country and over a million are in the diaspora. Um, and so I think that when we have these uh, these conversations about collaboration and solidarity, it's still very much driven by class because many of us don't have access to to resources to education, right? And and it's still sort of like it only happens between um, to those with friends in high places, you know. That's still the narrative. Um, the folks that have degrees and 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 they have those resources. But I'll tell you something here. You know that's the that's the bad side. Well, not the bad side. That's the challenge, right? But I'll tell you that one of the major lessons that we can learn from African um, feminism is something that um, Kim Love has been talking about: is that uh, we may not be necessarily walking around calling ourselves African feminists, but we're doing the good work, and so we're doing the work that needs to be done. Um, and even though feminism continues to be the dirty work that we talk about, but there are women who, they're feminists that are putting themselves, in, in inserting themselves in the many spaces, um, channeling that spirit of Audrey Lorde that um, Saret was talking about and putting their lives in danger for, for, to exist, right? And so one of the things that we could talk about is it's lift up the, the not only the names, but the experience of the everyday person, the everyday African feminist, the one who's at the market, the one who is teaching our children the, um, at the schools, um, the leaders of the local pride movements um, who are concerned with real issues specific to their local communities that not, don't necessarily, that aren't able to have their voices amplified on global platforms. So it's really important. And I think that's um, not, I think, I know that that's where I like to center my work. Um, and, I, and, and, and that's how I use my privilege of being in academia to make sure that I center the voices of, you know, my grandmother, my mother as absolutely the ones who are driving this thing. And so, and that's why I was struggling with the question because the world is still conditioned not to listen to the voices of everyday African women. And I'm here to tell you that that's some BS and we need to cut that out. Um, uh, yeah, stop right there. Teza, I'm so completely uh, agreeing with you. I think uh, definitely, especially what you're saying about who has access to places of privilege and, and just access to where not even decision is made, but where coordination is happening within the, uh, the movement on the continent as a Francophone. Uh, I mean, I just so happy, it just so happens that I like languages and I speak good English, but uh, knowing that that mere fact is giving me a ridiculous amount of access within the movement, I'm very bothered by that, honestly. Um, and I, I have been trying to use that access to make space for others, not not really like speaking for them because I haven't consulted all of them, but really make space like wherever I go to create like push <laughs> push for for them to come in, but also push the others. Um, and I think the the movement uh, is, the movements the African feminist movements on the continent are very English driven, uh, and um, and that so it's also up to us who don't whose like sister are not sisters are not anglophone to also remind uh, the, the leaders within the movement to make that space systematically, to provide translation, to make sure, you know, like all of this, it should not be something that we have to ask for. It just needs to happen. So I completely agree with you on that one. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges that I see. Uh, but I think what I would uh, add to that in terms of answering your question, Nana, is really, I think there's a lot to learn from um, African feminist practice 
uh, around sisterhood, how we center sisterhood uh, in the way we do, we do our work uh, in, and also in the way we live our lives is certainly uh, also at the center of my work with Ayala. And, and I think there's so much to learn if you just take the time to look. And I think even ourselves as African feminists, we're so busy and it's a rat race. You, know, you have too much to fight for and to fight against. But if we take the time of, to uh, kind of observe how we do it, the reason we're still standing is because of our sisters. So I think there's an immense amount of learning to be done there. And unfortunately, it's not as, I would say not as um, studied or researched or captured and documented as it should be. But there's a lot to learn there, in my opinion, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, like Taza Silva said, I think I'm pronouncing your name right. Taza, am I pronouncing your name right? Sorry, I'm on you. you are, yes, it is absolutely perfect. You're rolling your arms okay. perfectly. <laughs> okay. Like you said, the question was not difficult, but when how how are you how I was thinking, how am I going to tackle this question? How am I going to how am I going to like for example answer it? Because there are very many issues, there are very many issues to be talked about in this question. One, feminists, we are writers and thinkers. There are those people who can write. Me personally, I cannot write. I'm not a good writer, but I can think. I can think all the time. I'll, 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 I'll be thinking. So, as feminists, do how do we have people we are nurturing? No, most of the most of us are, are looking up. We are looking up. We are looking up to other people who are already there, and we've come and read about them. But they've not not nurtured us. But you have read about their work, which is really very good because their work has been put on the internet. We have read books about them, so that is really very good. So one of the practices feminists should really do, the work we are doing, should be put in most of the languages. We should we should use internet. Very well. We should know that internet is a very very strong tool which we are, we have to adopt to to work with. We are going to send messages. We are going to work very well if we adopt to use internet. So as feminists, we should think about those directors. And as thinkers, should, we should also think about how we're going to put our thinking into practice and should be out there on the internet in different languages. And also the writers should make sure that whatever they're writing about feminism should also be put in different languages, in African languages and even in other languages so that people can come read and understand. Even when you are gone, people can really come, read and understand that this person, this person came live was in exercise, he did A, B, C, D, F, G. And still so for me, I insist, we should also nature people for me, I love Dr. Stella Nyanzi. Taza, I like how you've been speaking about your parents and your grand grandparents. This is really very good because they have nurtured you and you, you're looking up to them. That's really very beautiful. Because every time you've, you've been given a chance to talk, to talk, you've talked about them. I really appreciate that. Every time I'm given a chance in any space to talk about someone, I'll talk about Stella Nyanzi because she nurtured me as a very young girl. Even when people never wanted to be close to LGBT people, she's like, please come to me. I went to office all the time. Um, I dropped out of school. I didn't even know how to write applications to go to conferences, apply for funding. And she really helped me so much. So I think as feminists, that is exactly what we are supposed to do. I'm a, for me, I learned English by associating with people like you. And I'm a, I'm a school dropout. My English is not very good. But because I knew what I wanted, I knew the kind of work I wanted to do. So I was like, yes, I need to do this. I need to learn this. I need to learn how to write. I need to learn how to speak. Um, and I really applaud Dr. Stanyans for giving me a chance to teach me English, to teach me how to write, to teach me how to use a computer. I learned from her office in Macquarie University. Please, thank you so much. And I'm looking, and thank you so much, the Black Women, sorry, I always forget, um, the Black Women Radicals. Thank you so much for this for I mean, I've seen new faces, except my other colleague I meet in Uganda. We Uh, seems like we might be having some brief technical difficulties. Can I just shout out everything that Kim Love was saying? That was just so so brilliant. And 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 Teresa and Francois, 
um, and Nampa as well. Like I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that so much of it is just, um, especially what you were saying, Terza, about understanding our, our roles in, in this ecosystem. Um, and and, uh, and and Kim Love, I as as especially as someone um, who identifies as a writer and as a storyteller, I think it's it's so um, so essential to like find a, a way and um, a means to to kind of um, excavate and uplift um, and and amplify um, stories uh, like Kim Love's and 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 our grandmothers and our aunties. Um, if we have, if that's if that's the the purpose that we feel called to, and in this case, I, I very much feel um, words are kind of my my anchoring and, and my root, and and the way that I'm able to kind of process um, what's happening in the world, and also um, to define and shape uh, who I am and 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 my kind of uh, sense of my whole whole self, you know. Um, so I I think that it's very much in 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 relationship building. It is very much about finding our position and our place within our communities. Um, and I think it it happens on on this kind of grander and international sense um, and and finding these connections, which you know just seeing this like Zoom box um, and and all the and imagining like all the places where each of you are on the map. It's just and all the people um, in this chat as well is just like such a such a, a, a beautiful kind of um, constellation in my just um, in my mind. Someone who identifies, you know, as a visual storyteller, I see that picture and I and I draw power and 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 kind of inspiration from that image. Um, so I think that that's so much a part of the work that we're doing. Um, and, and I, excuse me, excuse me. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, please. Sorry, I just went off because I don't take my taxi to use the internet. I'm really very sorry. I just went off. But I'm back. <laughs> I, was, I'm I was just giving you giving you love, Kim Love. I was just shouting you out and saying that I loved everything. Uh, that you, you didn't miss anything. Oh yeah, and yeah. um, so it's basically what everybody says. And I think the uh, important aspect here is to be aware of one's privilege uh, and use that. Um, to do the work because like we said, this is possible because um, uh, of <laughs> Jamie using her platform to get us all into the same space from, you know, um, all across Africa. And I think it's, it, um, it's, we all have a certain, we all have privilege in some way that we can use to, um, like Sarah would also say, storyteller, which is also my, my area, you know, as a writer, that's also how I try to do, um, use my privilege in that aspect by uh, telling the stories of the people um, that one doesn't hear about often enough, and then being able to use you know, my access to the internet and, um, you know, my access to electricity, which is also not always a given in, in my country, um, and use that to transmit these stories basically to the, to the broader community out there um, and give the people, in some cases, I don't, in a lot of cases, actually, <laughs> in my writing, I try to find the people that are either not talked about or that we don't hear about, um, or to find the story that isn't being told about the story that is being told. Um, and in, with that in mind, I try to go to the people who are exactly missing from these stories. And then just try to bring that um, across and try to get solidarity um, in that way. Um, or just not even, sometimes it's not even solidarity. Sometimes you just want to share what, you know, great things are happening on the continent or just to, you know, we are a continent with lots and we have, a whole reservoir of indigenous knowledge that is on this continent that the whole world could benefit from. Um, and it's still being largely held by people in rural areas, people in the um, what is considered here sometimes informal settlement. And I'm only using that word because I don't can't find a better word um, or term. Um, 
But yes, these are the people that usually are disconnected from the internet. These are the people that in a lot of cases also don't have necessarily TV. So um, there's really no real connection to the outside world. And I think um, growing up, um, like I said at the beginning, as a child of the liberation struggle and just understanding how much internationalism has kept me alive for starters and also has has told my story to the to the broader world out there i try to do the same um in my in my work can i just then i could take a minute to echo something that came out of what dampas just said and also Sa'ahat. i think this documenting piece and and what we decide to document i think it's super for me, really critical to like the way I understand the work and the way I, I do it. And I think part of it, I find when we, we know it's important to do, one thing that can stop us is thinking we don't have talent or we don't, we're not creatives. And Kim Love said, or oh, I'm not a writer. Well, I think the thing about documenting is about listening and sharing. I, if, you have, if, you, if you have, if you are lucky enough to have a phone and you can press record, if you just decide that you intentionally are going to listen, ask the right questions, as Nampa said, the questions that we are not used uh, to, even if you, ask, you interview like somebody who's quite famous, but there are some things, especially for African feminists, we are always asked to, to talk about our expertise. So we're given two minutes to talk to, to a journalist to make a case or we, you know, or to defend something or to react. But I found, and that's really the work that led me to Ayala is that there's also like, when are we going to ask uh, African feminists to talk about their journey, their experience is not their expertise, what they care about, why they care about it. That there is a story that we are not uh, so like used to, uh, to hearing. And I think even that just that, you know, and for this, you don't have to be uh, very great at writing or very great at, we just, you just need to be good at listening and be willing to listen and then share whatever, in whatever form. So I think like this, pressure, especially now to be an expert. You don't need to be an expert to listen. That's just what I wanted to share. Echo your echo, Francois, <laughs> because, because I felt, I again, very much agree with uh, what Nampa was saying about that privilege piece. Um, and I think what you were saying as well is, is absolutely right. I think that that kind of, um, that obstacle that we create for ourselves in terms of like that, um, sense of like uh, permission that's needed or, or, or even some some feeling of validity, you know, um, this is very much like, I think ingrained because of a colonial mentality because of, of imperialism and the patriarchy. Um, we feel that we are not worthy to tell our own stories. And because um, something that's kind of, uh, especially being very much focused on aesthetics, I've been thinking a lot of like monuments, especially seeing them coming down so rapidly around the world. It's, you know, that that kind of confrontation is like, who's been allowed to be propped up as the heroes, you know? And I think that this moment for us now and, and very much, you know, the foundation that we come from, is, you know, our people that deserve their, their monuments, everyday people that, that in their kind of their 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 survival and in their their daily lives, you know, are are really very much the ones who who deserve to be kind of um, exalted as the heroes and who deserve to be documented in history books. Um, yes. Yeah. Quickly. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> speak to. I'll go after. I'm sorry. Let me just add something. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Francois, for that. It's it's absolutely true. I I have to say that. Um, I owe the fact that I know that I'm a black African feminist woman to my education at a historically black college and university in the United States, right? So my graduate education is when I figured out what it actually meant to be black. Um, as the first Creole, arguably the first Creole nation in the world, Cabo Verde, we didn't walk around talking about being black. Um, we, didn't, we, we didn't talk about this piece of blackness and what it looked like or, you know, what does it mean to be a black feminist? But learning my particular um, field of study, political science, from the position of those who have been historically marginalized, right? Because we were centered at a historically black college. Shout out to all HBCUs, black people. Y'all should just go ahead and go on to an HBCU, especially during this time, if you have the opportunity to. 
you, I went to school with people from all over the world. Um, you, we got a chance to exchange people with all different um, education and ethnic class backgrounds. And this is where I learned that all of our voices mattered, all of our stories were centered. And this is where that I began to ask for permission to speak in front of my grandmother, that I learned the importance of that, that with all my fancy degrees and education, that still she is the smartest, badass feminist that I know. To center her voice and her story and to give her, always give her the space to tell her story and my mom as well. And so, I have to say, shout, I have to give that shout out to being able to, the privilege to be in the diaspora, to be a black woman in the diaspora. And that provided me with different lenses to look back at, at my continent and want to do the work that I do, right? Um, and, and, and so I, I just was so inspired. I'm sort of emotional, sorry. Maybe that's the mom in me. Like I just, I can cry in a moment's notice. Um, just so inspired by all of what you all are saying that I, I just I, ha, I just felt in that moment that I had to give that shout out to my history, my education that I received at Clark Atlanta University at the Atlanta University Center in Atlanta, Georgia, um, as key because I felt that my experience as an African woman was centered, and the stories of African people were centered. We were not last in syllabi anywhere. We were front and center, always first. It, it, it was it was a, a, an amazing time. Can I just add one more thing? I was just going to um, say that I think a lot of what I have had found myself doing in especially now is is unlearning as much as learning. Um, and, I, and I think that um, again, coming back to um, positioning right our, and our privilege, uh, recognizing just as you did Terza, um, that I had the, the ability to go to a university, that I had the ability to get my master's, um, that I had the ability to be born in the US and have a certain sense of privilege and the ability to um, go back to my mother and father's birth country in summers and absorb those experiences, but at the same time return to Americanized privilege, you know, um, so, so recognizing that what, what my perspective is one that comes from a specific type of experience, right? Um, and when I come to stories, I have to be very much um, mindful of this, even when I'm telling my grandmother's story, right? Because I'm telling it from a perspective, a specific time um, and perspective. So I just wanted to, to add that piece that so much of, I feel like what I'm doing now simultaneously, and, and I think so much uh, that's that's really critical is about holding multiple truths at once, right? So on one side, I'm just kind of learning as much as possible, absorbing as much as possible, and on the other side, stripping <laughs> a lot of the baggage um, and a lot of the kind of um, programming that is really flawed and, and, and indicative of a system. Yeah. Well, I want to get into the storytelling because everybody was talking about that in some way, and that was, um, yes, very, um, for me as a writer also, it, uh, I sometimes also, as a writer and as a feminist in this context, I also sometimes have to, um, uh, or I learned through unlearning, <laughs> like Sarah uh, mentioned, um, that sometimes the stories, a lot of not just sometimes, a lot of times the stories that uh, I am telling on behalf of other people, because it's not my stories, obviously, um, are not always the stories that I want to tell or that I necessarily, um, so sometimes it's really about going outside of your, of your feminist comfort also and going to get a, and feminist comfort, I mean, like there are certain stories that are just an obvious, this is how it should be, this is completely unjust, we don't want this. Um, but then there are also some stories that are not so, you know, like you can't really, um, and maybe just to give an example is a story that I did last year on, um, uh, yeah, I probably need some sugar warnings for this. Um, but yes, it was a story that um, I did on female genital mutilation in my country, in Namibia, which is also something that doesn't come up a lot in this country. And it's not a story that I 
necessarily wanted to tell at that moment in time. And also when I told it, what I really had to do was get outside of myself in that sense that I went to actually speak to the, not to the victims, but to, to the victims of the actual acts, but to the, to the women who carry out these um, these uh, uh, acts of mutilation and, um, you know, and hear their story and hear why they do what they do and get a um, much deeper understanding also of um, how, again, with different upbringings, um, it's easy for us to see something as this is just wrong and it shouldn't be like that without understanding the people that are actually doing this work, why they see some benefit in it. And I'm not saying there's a benefit to it, but just to hear their side and be able to tell the story as it is without overlaying it with your judgment or with your, and I think that is for me, um, depending on what I'm talking about or writing about, um, very important so that we we carry the stories as they were told to us and we don't not every story needs to be modified and and, and packaged into some you know feminist um uh, look good look good look or whatever packaging so that in order for you to tell it to the rest of the world um yeah Hi everyone, it's, it's me. I'm back again. Um, after being behind the scenes, I'm, I'm back. Um, I just, Nana asked me to come in for the, because we're at the point where Q&A um, and I didn't want to come on, but Nana was like, come on. Okay, anyway, I'm really super excited and thank you so much again for this conversation. Um, I've been getting so much feedback behind the scenes people saying this is like the best webinar ever, people asking for a reading list. Um, people are like, you know, I want to go to HBCU now and you know, all sorts of things. And everyone's just saying so many wonderful things about, uh, there's also 13 questions as well and more, even on the YouTube live and, and on Twitter. So I would like to say quickly, one of the reasons why I decided to take back, take a step back from hosting, not only because Nana is amazing, is because as a Black American woman, I feel like it is important to, when we have these discussions, to take a step back and let, you know, in this case, African women and gender non-conforming and non-binary radicals to speak for themselves. I can only do so much. Yes, Black power, you know, all those type of things, right? But that doesn't mean my experience is like yours and your experience is like mine. And we, we face and uh, have different issues and concerns based on the context and the cultures and the dynamics we are in. And so I think it's so important that we, like all of you were saying, use our privilege, but also know when to take a step back and honor uh, one another for our talents, for our leadership, for our activism, for our lives and the works. I honor you all, like every single one of you. Um, so inspired. So, like I said, I'd rather be behind the scenes, but you know, a thug must, you know, got to do what a thug must do anyway. <laughs> so, um, so we have about, so it was supposed to be till one o'clock, but I decided, yes, yeah, someone said thug life. Jillian, yes, that thug life. Okay, yes. Um, so it's 108 now and there's so many questions that people have. Um, and one of the questions, um, let me see. And we're gonna go to 130, okay? So um, yeah, so someone asked, do you include African Caribbean people um, and people of the Caribbean and African feminisms. One of the questions. Um, yes, I think I touched on that a little bit earlier. So um, just to go into uh, that again, I absolutely, personally for me, I include um, Africans wherever they live. I, or, or black people, um, you know, with that, I don't see it any other way. And as much as, but, there's a but, but 
<laughs> there, there, I still, I would include it as black feminism. Every, I don't know, it's tricky, eh? But it's it, for me, it's, for me personally, <laughs> for me personally, it's African because of the African roots of the people that are the feminists in the countries that they are in. However, that. African feminism for me also obviously uh, is about the context in which you find yourself in. And um, so that would also be your location, you know? So as such, I clearly wouldn't um, quali quanti you know, qualify them under African, continental African feminism, but I don't see how, how I cannot see Black feminism elsewhere, um, unless they choose not to be a, a part of African feminism, or or maybe it's not Black feminism everywhere, but it's definitely those Black feminists that incorporate Africa into their activism and into their awareness. The feminists that have a deep understanding of how they are still linked to the continent, um, I feel are definitely a part of African feminism. Um, yes, but I think maybe that is my thing. And I think maybe for, for it's, it, it would be up to the feminists themselves, I guess, to decide at the end of the day. Um, but I think it, it's, it's, for me, it's imperial to be able to build Africa across the continents. Um, because at the end of the day, Africa is not just a location, like I was saying earlier, but everybody who carries Africa within themselves and who identifies with, with carrying um, Africa within themselves, for me, is a part of um, a broader uh, African feminism. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that my um, personally, my my definition of uh, blackness, of Africanness, of uh, feminism, all of those are are very intersectional and expansive, um, and 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 inclusive. Um, so I, I feel in the same way that kind of the the work uh, that I do around um, language, to borrow um, from Toni Morrison, um, is very much kind of rooted in this idea of like black geographies um, about how our concepts of identity um, of black of the black aesthetic kind of migrate um, and how we kind of internalize the definitions of of our identity and and also express them as well across the diaspora. So. Um, I absolutely would include um, uh, any person who, you know, I, I, similarly, like Nampa was saying, I want to be very much um, respective of how people want to refer to themselves um, and defer to however you personally identify. But yes, my, my definitions are very broad and expansive. I wanted to move sorry. to another, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I also just wanted to speak about, especially the uh, Caribbean is so much um, like it's it's very, very African rooted still. So for me, especially the Caribbean is one, you know, it's it's a geographical location that I cannot extract out of out of Africa, like, unless they choose to. It's interesting. I'm just going to finish on because I don't want to say too much because I struggle with this uh, sometimes in the work that I do uh, with the platform. So I interview African feminists and I've been asked multiple times, why don't you interview African feminists from the Caribbean? And, and is it, does that mean that you don't consider them to be African feminists? My answer is no. I include them uh, in my definition of African feminists for all the reasons Nampa you've just outlined. But I find it uh, difficult to center them in this particular uh, part of the work that I do. Uh, and I, I think, and, and you know, look, my initiative is like two years also. Uh, there might be a lot of progression on that, but I find sometimes that the, the, the it, yeah, I struggle with that for, for that reason of like making the difference between including and centering. I think that some of the work that we do needs uh, at least the work that I do needs African feminist voices that that go out, but also really, as you said, the context is important. So I focus on that. 
Um, and also, I wanted to say that sometimes I find one of the issues when we look at um, we look at uh, African, uh, like we look at the diaspora and the continent all back together, we tend to like reduce it to black. And as somebody who looks also as North Africa, I, I find like there's also that diversity that we need to remind ourselves of um, very often and very deliberately. Uh, but yes, I know I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but I just wanted to say for me, it's, it's clear conceptually, but when it comes to applying it to my work, I find that I have to, to, to be vulnerable and admit this. Sometimes it's a bit of a push and pull between the clarity of where I want to go and making sure I am as, as I, as I, you used the word, I think expansive. I, I, I think that tension is there and I would love to, to get some views from like the audience or others on, on how you deal with that. So I just wanted to include that. Thank you all for that. I wanted to move to a question that I know we have limited time and I thought this was a really good question. I'll read it out verbatim. Uh, thanks, thanks for such an engaging and enriching conversation. I'm trying to articulate a question that invites panelists, feminist visions for pleasure, sex and sexuality. Uh, someone mentioned, um, they mentioned several blogs that focus specifically on African women's pleasure um, and sexuality. And the question is along the lines of how do you as individuals imagine or engage feminism, pleasure, sexuality in your work? Like, so what does it mean to be an African feminist that also speaks to and talks about and centers and uplifts intimate conversation, intimate relationship? Um, um, for example, me, I'll, I'll give an example of how we've talked about sex and pleasure. When in Uganda, we had um, an event called the sex workers night. During the sex workers night, we used to teach people about sex and bedroom issues. So for me and my other colleagues, that's how we've we've engaged and we've we've, we've been able to talk about sex and sexuality and everything that comes up with sex and pleasure. Because we we, we organized an event called the sex workers night, and people could come in and they go to learn very many things about sex. So it was an event for eighteen and above. So that's, that's how we did it in Uganda. And for others, I get, um, I kind of wanted to talk, or just everybody in general too, because I do think this is a really important conversation. It's something I've also been thinking about lately as well, like access to pleasure and what that looks like for African women um, is such a, a vital thing to think about, especially as we live within patriarchy I'm grateful for the whoever posed the question. I wanted to leave space if there were any more comments, if not from our panelists, if not, we can move to um, another question because we have a lot of people are really interested to hear you all's perspectives and I am as well. Briefly on the, uh, Teresa, please go ahead. I've been talking for long. <laughs> I was just going to say briefly on, uh, on sexuality and pleasure in particular. I think uh, for me, it's about, uh, making, creating spaces for us to say it out loud. I think as African women, it's, it's such hushed conversations. It has to be hidden, it has to be, you know, uh, and I, I find that uh, the, we were talking about what does that mean to be radical? I think just to make it, to normalize, make it like every day actually encourages uh, those conversations to be out, to be like open. I remember, so I, I uh, with Ayala, I, I host sister circles, a small group, 20 uh, African uh, women and non-binary, like we just, we come all in a circle. And then we, what we do is have intimate conversations about who we are, the issues we want to talk about. And at the beginning, I remember having this conversation in Niger. Uh, and in Niger, it's one of the places, the most, um, reserved women I've seen on the continent in Niger. Uh, and, and it just takes for you to say, it's okay to talk about it. This is a space, not the, everything that happens in the circle stays in the circle. The moment you've established that, people will not stop talking about it. And I think making, normalizing that, letting people know it's okay, sharing. And we had very candid conversations about young women who really wanted to have 
they had they, they felt like oh, I really want to have sex but I know my religion doesn't allow me so does that mean I need to get married because I know if I get married uh, whoever I, um, uh, I get married to will then want me to stop studying so having those conversations in a way that's away from judgment uh, making and also as much as possible when people are comfortable having those conversations publicly the more we have them the more we normalize them so for me that's part of the work and and you take a lot of heat for that to be honest uh, because you know you want to be, our daughters are going to become perverts because of you but you know I think it's part of the work if you can take it I think it's worth it's worth it if you can't take it because it's tough though I have to say that can I, um, this goes back to access, so it may be limited. Um, and I just wanted to add some uh, like watch list options that, that I thought of as this conversation was happening. Um, and two of them are by Michaela Cole, who is um, a, a British Nigerian writer um, and, uh, or Nigerian Brit. I always forget the hyphenates, um, but uh, she- uh, <laughs> But Got thank you. <laughs> Um, but chewing gum on Netflix and uh, I may destroy you, which are on um, and H, which is on HBO now, um, are, are both like beautiful takes on. I, I just think on like black female interiority um, and both relationships to pleasure as well as trauma and how again like they're always operating on parallel tracks. Um, and uh, water well, wa watermelon woman by uh, Cheryl Denier, um, which is just like a beautiful kind of exploration of finding your community um, and and uh, representation of, of black women, uh, especially queer um, and lesbian black women um, and people who are, you know, typically uh, underrepresented in terms of like their sexuality um, and their sexual identity, gender identity um, and, and gender nonconforming um, conversations and identities. Yes. Um, and, uh, Tessa, you go. <laughs> no, no, I, you, you go this time, because last time I went. Go. <laughs> okay, so um, to add to that topic, and I think it's, it's a very, very important topic you have, um, I think uh, it's also, again, important to look at the context from which we're coming from. So as African nations, obviously, we have been colonized, and a lot of that... Um, uh, a huge part of that colonization brought with it the aspects of shame around sex and sexuality, um, especially also through the laws and um, bills that were made on this continent by colonizers telling us who we should be, how we should interact with one another, who we are. Um, and so for me, um, at the moment, what I can think of in the bro in the broader sense, not just on a personal note, is to be aware of that and then to also work towards dismantling exactly that that was put in place. Uh, so, for instance, we um, you know looking at um, at at uh, sodomy laws in our country. Uh, you know, Uganda had, um, Uganda and Kenya, a lot of all other countries also have um, colonial homophobic laws in place. Um, Anti-abortion um, laws that we have, for instance, in our country, which um, we are currently fighting for, for abortion to be legalized. And this is being led by a great feminist beauty boys. I should actually should have shouted her out earlier who is doing the work um, at the moment alongside other people at um, getting rid of, of you know, uh, abortion law or legalizing abortion in our country. And I think um, because even if we, it's very difficult sometimes in the African context to speak to even your parents or your mother uh, about sex and, and, and um, sexuality and stuff. So we come, a lot of times from families who were able to really talk about it, maybe hush, 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 but it's not out there. It's something you do behind closed doors. You don't see, you don't see what happens. You, you, you kind of, you know, like it's even for people that sometimes, you know, find themselves in a marriage and then realize, oh, this is what goes down, you know, like having absolutely no idea and they should have been prepared for it. But again, with the colonial history, we have so much shame around sex and sexuality that we also need to look at 
how um, not just in our personal lives, but in the broader context, how we can really work at dismantling these, you know, the homophobic laws and um, laws and uh, anti-abortion laws that don't serve anybody, you know. Thank you all for that. I'm going to, another question we have is, as a young African feminist living and working in the US, I find myself somewhat isolated and estranged from the feminist struggle back home. For those living in the diaspora, how do you reconcile work that needs to be done where you are versus back home? Do you think there should even be a distinction? I see you shaking your head because that's a real question. I felt that one. Yeah, I feel like I struggle with that question every single day, especially now, as I said, there's so much happening in Ethiopia. Um, there is a genocide that's happening that I feel just so um, ignorant of, like, and, and so much history and, and, um, and conflict that I just need to, that I, I that I struggle to kind of write about because there's so much that I need to just equip myself in terms of understanding um, and so much space that I want to create for others who have a, a, an existing understanding and lived experience that they should have the means to speak to um, and a platform um, to, to, to be able to share their experiences. Um, so yeah, like internally, I feel like I struggle with that a lot. And, 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 and I feel like it creates a bottleneck in my work and a, in a lot of ways my kind of, I feel kind of output and processing is I, I, again being very site specific and being based in DC, I am kind of using a lot of uh, thought, theory, um, language that I kind of have been surrounded with just circumstantially and applying it through um, and, and, uh, and kind of applying it to this kind of pan-Africanist uh, perspective, which again can be very um, incompatible at times. Uh, and, and, and I struggle to really make sense of the connections that I feel uh, exist so naturally. So I, I say all this to say that I don't have an answer and I feel very much kind of um, torn by, by that feeling of wanting to, uh, wanting to address clearly like very um, um, very like co conflicts that are happening um, in both of my homes, I feel. So um, I I've shared I've shared those feelings before, sorry it's like you know I've talked about it with mentors and particularly about being born and raised in a particular place and most of my family still being there, but the US is my current home. And so much of my work, you know, focuses on Cape Verdean women, um, particularly in the diaspora. Um, I had to grapple with the fact that um, th this is my reality, this is where I am and what I can do and what we can do, again, these are not all the answers, but this is how I'm rationalizing this thing. Um, what we can do is uh, amplify the voices of those that are back home because they're more than capable of telling their own stories and, and knowing the realities and projecting that. Sometimes we just have to, to help them amplify that, right? So case in point, right now, because of the pandemic, the cases of violence, of, of gender-based violence and sexual assault and rape against women and girls is spiking. And that's happening throughout the world, right? Somehow I was a part of, I, I was included, not somehow, but I was, in, I was added to a Facebook conversation, private conversation that says, okay, so we have to do something about it because clearly the local government is not the justice system is not working, folks are not being brought to justice. However, what they came up with was, um, uh, you know, like a campaign, five seconds, you know, say no, like, based, you know, it, it, enough is enough. I think that was the hashtag in Creole. And so I silently listened, I watched the discussion go on. I didn't really say much because as we talked about before, is it's really about knowing when to just be quiet and listen, right? And so I follow the discussion, the women who are on the ground, these are the activists that are on the ground, laid out everything in like a day of what we were supposed to do. I would, at night after the kids would go to bed, I would read all the messages. I'm like, okay, so what is the plan? What am I supposed to do? 
okay, you need a five second video, wake up in the morning, I'm doing a five second video, this is the email that it's going to, email sent, thank you. So knowing the follow directions, right? And knowing and, and being okay with that. It cannot be perfect. The amount of work that we, that, um, that we are able to do, we can expect too much, but we can do, we can always say, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help you bring this message to different audiences? So as many of you know, I'm more active on Twitter. So I'm gonna make sure that, send me something that I can put on Twitter. So do what you can to get that out there. And so, and also I talk a lot of junk on Twitter. So the president of the country follows me. So I'm gonna say, um, excuse me, Mr. President, um, there's these things happening in your country. What, what um, can, can, I, can I just pick your brain? You know, there's a level of sarcasm because radical feminism and, and a, a level of putting you on front street, you know, uh, because I'm like, because folks are asking. So can you give us some answers, please? The, we know that social media, you know, these platforms is where it's at right now, right? And so there's nothing wrong with that. Please don't feel isolated. Just know that the little that you are able to do or the most that you're able to do um, is just, is, is good enough. Reach out to one or two organizations, reach out to one of one or two of your sisters or brothers in the struggle and say, how can I be involved? And, and, and be okay with that, because that's good enough. Thank you all so, so much. Um, unfortunately, everybody, we weren't able to get to all the questions, but what I would like to do is give the panelists 30 seconds to a minute to just share final thoughts, um, share things that they're working on. And also for everybody who can stay on the line, thank you so much. If you've stayed on for um, as long as we've been, thank you once again, but just wanted to open up for our panelists. 30 to 60 seconds, last thoughts and share anything that you're working on because people are very interested in how they can also support your work. Okay, sorry, I've been on and off. My internet is really so bad, um, but I'd like to say, and my name is Kim. an organization for trans women, sex workers, and refugees living with HIV. Right now, COVID has affected us so much and our work. So we are trying to raise funds to help people to get just food and rent and to be able to have their medicine. There's a GoFund page that we created to help people get food and to be able to access their HIV made sense. Thank you so much, everybody. I can share with you the link. Thank you so much. Yeah, just to say, um, yeah, thank you for everybody who contributed to this conversation. Uh, you uh, were all amazing. And um, yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, at Nampa, and I think it's written somewhere. I think it's somewhere in the comments. Um, and that is also where you find my work. Um, at this moment in time, I um, think the support that uh, we need is to uh, have maybe more people, maybe any of you can sign um, our go, um, not go fund me, our, um, the petition that uh, Beauty Boys uh, has been it for to legalize abortion in our country. And then um, together with Jamie, we also set up a petition for um, LGBTQI uh, plus refugees living in Kakuma uh, in Kenya who definitely need to get out of that camp and would appreciate maybe um, if you could sign it and just, yeah, make people aware of that. Uh, I'll go. I, I just wanted to say first thank you, Jamie and Nana, for hosting us. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for sharing such amazing thoughts and also references. I, I have lots of notes that I will, I'll go through. Um, for me, I just wanted to say to everyone uh, that it's important for me to continue to practice 
uh, our feminism without performing it. So I think sometimes looking at, especially for us who uh, are online a lot, uh, this thing of like deciding whether or not you're going to say something be on, on and who you're going to talk to on the basis of like how it's going to be received. I've really struggled with that. There's something I said earlier that I wasn't sure I was going to say, but I was like, nope, let's go and do it. Um, and I know I might get some hate for it, but that's just the way it is. So that idea of performance is very important. And I also wanted to echo something Nampa said before that's uh, about uh, trying to amplify voices in an unfiltered way instead of using your own lenses, uh, putting them over it. Uh, so I can, and that's a lot of the work that I do with ALR conversations, uh, unfiltered. It's a lot more work, I have to admit, but it's it's completely worth it. So you can find that work at ayala, e -Y -A -L -A dot blog, also at ayala blog on Twitter and um, Instagram. And I just wanted to say, oh, you're so welcome to join me on the, at the Flip the Script campaign that I'll be running next uh, week on ALA blog, on social media to talk about uh, all the narratives and social norms around African women uh, that are being uh, used in a way to justify and perpetuate oppression against us. It's um, ahead of uh, 31st of July, which is the Day of the African Women. So we'll be talking about what are the new norms that we want to have that allows us to talk about ourselves as who we are and not what we're supposed to be. So find me on Ayala blog on social media. Thanks. And thanks again for everyone for staying a bit longer to stop with us. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to all my sisters or uh, siblings as, as I'm learning as well um, uh, on the panel and um, the, the attendees as well. Thank you, Jamie, for organizing this and just all that you do with um, Black Women Radicals. It's just so amazing and inspiring. Um, I uh, can be found, I, I'm, I'm working on a lot of different projects, writing projects and uh, multidisciplinary projects. Uh, so you can find my work, uh, my poetry mostly on Instagram um, and other works in progress at Sara It Does. Um, you can also found, find me, uh, S-A-A-R-E-T Does, um, on uh, Patreon and Substack as well. Um, I also share petitions and other uh, issues of interest uh, via Twitter, and that's Sara It Says. Um, I also talk a, a little bit of junk, um, but I'm going to be following uh, Terza to, to see what she's saying to the president. Um, so I look forward to continuing these conversations. Yeah, I, I am so not here for respectability politics. I, want, I, I just be running my mouth and, you know, I'm conscious of what I say. You know, I'm not just saying stuff. I, I speak things that I, I speak about things that I feel that are um, important, but also that people can relate to um, from the personal all the way to, you know, my scholarly work. Um, so for example, having to always perform that everything is absolutely amazing as Francois was talking about, like yesterday, I was just having a really bad day. Like, you know, just one of those days. And I, I put it on Twitter. Today is one of those mentally draining days. And that's okay. And, you know, instead of always saying, have a great day. It's a wonderful day out here. No, today is pretty crappy. So let's start with that and let's try again tomorrow. Um, and that's okay too. Um, so then I always feel like I'm performing some level of social media, uh, you know, smoke screen. Um, this has been amazing. My heart is so full. Um, I've, I'm meeting all these siblings. Thank you for that. Uh, all these siblings from everywhere in the world. I appreciate you from um, uh, Akeem Love. I'm over here fangirling. I, I don't know. Like, I can't believe you followed me on Twitter, on, on Facebook. It was a whole moment for me. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, thank oh, you. God. <laughs> I was like, you just don't know. Um, <laughs> um, it was pretty exciting. Um, I've put a bunch of stuff on the chat, uh, links. If you, you know, I'm, I shouldn't be the only Cape Verdean woman you will hear about or whatever. So I've amplified the voices of a whole bunch of folks through my YouTube channel that I'm gonna put the link here, uh, articles that I've written where there's additional links to other, other people that you, you know, you should go directly and hear from interviews that were done with some of these women. Some of them have subtitles, some of them not. Um, some, some things are in English. 
Uh, I am the co-founder of the Poderosa Conference. I also put that in the chat. Poderosa means empowered woman in uh, Cabo Verdean Creole. And that is a biannual conference held in uh, Providence, Rhode Island in the United States that centers the lives of Cape Verdean women, not just in the diaspora, but we have women that come from uh, Cape Verde, all over Europe. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a platform for Cape Verdean women, but everyone is welcome to come. So um, lots of our African, other African sibling, siblings come through. And so it's absolutely amazing. Um, what else? Connect with me on Twitter. I'd love to just talk some junk with you on Twitter. Um, some constructive junk, you know, I call it um, calling people out on their anti-feminist conversations and stuff like that. And we could also talk about, you know, what's your favorite African artist and um, what songs you're listening to, because that is what we do. We're able to jump from one thing to the other. I am so thankful for this space. I appreciate you, Nana, Jamie, my newly found siblings. I appreciate you and let's keep this thing going. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna hand it over to Jamie. But yes. thank you all for everything. This has been great. I needed this. I needed this, especially on a Wednesday. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Listen, it was so great. Y'all are so dope, so amazing. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, it will be up on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube. So please come back and reference. Make sure to follow all these amazing, amazing panelists, including Nana. Like, follow Nana and Nana's work. Um, I wish you spoke, spoke a little bit more about the amazing work. Uh, not, Nana, Nana is amazing. Like everyone's amazing. Nana, yeah, I got you girl. But anyway, it was this great conversation. Thank you hey, so Jamie, much. Again. Can I say something? Did we talk about how amazing you are? No. Yes, Jamie. <laughs> yes, please. No, no, this, it's, it's, this is about creating community and I'm always humbled to learn. And I think we should, take a step back and learn from each other. And so I'm honored. I honor your leadership and uh, I'm gonna cry thug tears really after this because I'm so overwhelmed, but seriously, I'm really emotional about how great this was. So thank you to the audience. Thank you everybody. I bought like a tears about to come out and yeah, thank you so much again. Thank you, bye for hosting. Thank you for hosting. Thank bye you so everybody. much. Bye everybody, be well. Bye. Thank you so good much. Good night and good afternoon to wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Woo. It was great, y'all. Yes. You did that, Jamie. Are we off recording? Yes. 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 It looks like you're still live. Eh? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we're on, still on YouTube. Still oh, on no, YouTube. it's a lag. It's a lag on YouTube, right? Okay. Yeah, I think it's like 20 seconds behind. Okay. okay. I think. I said I stopped recording, so. Yeah, um. don't say anything till I, till I stop seeing <laughs> this live. Eh? <laughs> Wait, can they hear it? Say, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on, you are still there. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> no. Okay, we're going to put that quote. Okay, so let me just stop the video and end it. Thank you so much. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye, so Bye. Thank, you. thank you so much, much for staying with us. Bye, y'all. Bye. 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 <laughs>